Good morning, everybody. All right, all right, yeah, 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 there we go, there we go. Um, uh, it is another wonderful day. Uh, let us rejoice and be glad in it from God. So let's go ahead and stand up. We're going to start with our first song, Won't Stop Now. Here we go. One, two, three. I says, I give you glory. I give you glory for all. For all. is coming. By faith, I see a miracle. God made me a promise. I may know he don't fail on his promises. Amen.
one thing we can count on. Here we go. Count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. No, he won't. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same. The same God that's never late is working all things out. He's working. Working all things out. Say yes. Nothing can stand, and nothing can stand against. I choose to praise, to glorify, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against, and nothing can stand against. One more time, I choose to praise, to glorify, to glorify, glorify the name of all. Stand against me. That nothing, nothing can stand, stand against. I choose to praise. I choose to praise. To glorify. To glorify. Glorify the name of all things. That nothing can stand against That nothing can stand against Amen. Amen. Church, will you please join me in prayer? 
God, we do choose to praise you and we are so thankful that we can be here together today in this space at this time to praise and to glorify you, whether we are at a mountaintop high or if we are in a low valley, we know that you are right beside us. All we need to do, God, is reach out to you, to talk to you, to know that you are always with us no matter what. Thank you for this community of faith. I'd ask that you help each of us to look for ways that we can reach out and support each other and let people know they're not alone on this journey of life, on this journey of faith. Ask all this in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. Well, church, would you stay standing for a little while longer and greet each other this morning? of the aisle there is an attendance pad you can pass down I love these because you can sign in and then as you send it back down you can know who you're sitting with in your in your row so welcome I'm Sarah Hendricks I'm so glad that you're with us this morning if you're worshiping online welcome if you are here for the first time we are so happy you're with us and we would love to connect with you after church at the Connect Here Center right outside the sanctuary. We have a gift bag for you. We would just love to say hello and welcome you here today. Great things happening in the church this week. Um, I'm kind of adding this one in extra. It's It wasn't officially in the announcements, but I had a wonderful time at 9.30 this morning. The youth prayer team met in the chapel. If you did not know, we have a new youth prayer team. I'm super proud of the youth on that. Three high schoolers and two middle schoolers were getting together once in a while, and we are praying for the youth in our church and in our community. So that was a blessing for me today. We have people pizza with the pastors after this service. So if you are new to the congregation or you'd just really like to know these two fine people up here better, uh, Pastor Emily and Deacon Jeannie will be in the Serve Center with pizza after worship today. And you are welcome to join them. And, and if you have family with you, your whole family can go and enjoy some pizza and ask them all of your pressing questions that you've ever thought of. Food cupboard is filling up so nicely. Thank you so much for the donations you've been bringing. If you have never gotten to see where the food cupboard is, I would invite you to ask about that after worship. Last week, we showed it to a couple that were like, I'm really curious, where is this food cupboard? Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful ministry. So we appreciate you helping to stock the shelves. And if you wanna look at it, you're welcome to go in after church and we can show you the food cupboard. Tuesday morning from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., I will be in the chapel area right down the hall with coffee, and I would love to have you stop by for just a short prayer time, time to think about our children, our youth, our teachers, our families in the community. It's just a nice, quiet space for you. You can stay 10 minutes. You can stay an hour, you can stay as long as you want to, but you are welcome on Tuesday morning to stop by for coffee and prayer. Deacon Jeannie has an announcement about Serve Day. Good morning. We have our 10th annual Serve Day coming up on Sunday, October 9th. This is when we worship by going out into our community to serve. 
And so if you want to sign up for a project, they're all listed on the table outside the sanctuary. You can also sign up online at mcphersonfumc.com slash projects. If you have questions about the projects or you don't find a place for you but you want to serve, please talk to me and I'd like to find a way for you to engage in our serve day. We will have one worship service that Sunday at 9 a.m. and we're going to worship in Hess Hall. And so it'll be a really short gathering where we'll um, eat donuts together and fellowship and then go forth in service to our community. So I hope that you can make it. And for those worshiping online, we will have a recorded um, service that Emily and I will put up so that you still have an opportunity to worship that Sunday. I also wanted to let you know about our fall small groups. Uh, these will begin the first week of October on October 2nd. And um, the focus of the groups this fall is to build community and connection with one another. So we're kind of going back to our roots as Methodists and we're doing a Wesleyan small group model where we're just gonna get together and check in with how our souls are doing um, share joys and concerns and read some scripture together. So if you're new or you're not engaged in a small group or if you want to meet with some new people as well, I encourage you to sign up. You can sign up online at mcphersonfumc.com slash fallgroups or if you prefer to fill out a paper copy, there are forms on the table at the Connect Here Center. I have one additional thing to share this morning. Um, so if you look in your bulletins, um, the, uh, we had a family that was supposed to join this morning, uh, Linda Allen and Chris and Shauna Schaefer. Uh, they are still planning to join next week. However, they wanted me to share with you that this morning, Linda's sister Susan had a cardiac event and she's home now, but she was in the hospital earlier. They're still waiting to hear back um, from the doctor on next steps. So. Um, they are there uh, with Susan right now, and I, we just invite you to keep their whole family in prayer, especially especially Susan, as as they wait to figure out what's what's coming next, and um, as as she heals and as she undergoes whatever medical procedures are coming. So, um, please be in prayer for Susan and for Linda and Chris and Shauna and Naoma as well. All right, I'd love to have the kids come up and join me this morning. Also, if you're a camper here that's going to share, you can come up too. Some of you are campers and kids. All right, welcome. So this morning, Children's Story is going to be a little different because we're going to have some of the youth share about their camp experience at Camp Horizon this summer. Camp Horizon is a United Methodist camp that's near a town called Ark City. And if you've never been there, it's kind of buried back in the woods, isn't it? For you campers who have been there, it's a nice sort of hidden place that feels a little bit relaxing. You can go and kind of take a deep breath. Um, we go there for confirmation too. So some of the youth have been there and some of you might look forward to going there for confirmation retreat. So this morning, I was hoping that some of you who went to camp might be willing to share just a little bit about what you really, really liked about camp. Kinsley, would you be willing to start since you're the oldest up here? Maybe tell your name and then just share a little bit about what your camp experience was like. So my name is Kinsley, and I just remember one thing from camp is that I was super nervous because I wasn't bringing a friend or anything. So I was really scared to make friends. And once I got there, I felt like really kind of nervous. And I made so many friends, actually, and I still keep in touch with them. And I had no problem with making friends at all. So. I just remember that being super cool. Let's see, Malachi, do you want to share about, um, Kinsley was at high school camp. What was the name of your camp? Did it have a special name? Or was it, what, what ages was it for? Third, third, fourth, and fifth graders? Okay, do you want to share what you liked about camp? Um, um, with Kinsley's, it was really fun just making friends and everything because you got to have many experiences. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. 
Let's see, Banks, do you want to share a little bit about just something you liked at camp? The bouncy pillow. Say it one more time. The bouncy pillow. What is a bouncy pillow? It's, it's just this big air up, like big pillow thing where you just jump on like a trampoline. And you can just do it whenever you want to? Kind of. <laughs> Thank you, Banks. I have been on the bouncy pillow, but I'm so old now that it makes me dizzy. <laughs> so... I just watch people do that now. Okay, James, what do you want? Now, James had kind of a not so great, he did get sick and have to go home from camp, but he assures me that there was some positive things about camp prior to the sickness. Bouncy pillow, <laughs> pool and rock wall in the pool. Fun stuff. Sleeping in my room. That's not my room. <laughs> okay. Hey, for people who haven't been to camp, how many people are in your place where you guys sleep? There's like one big cabin, and there's two. Di yeah, there's two different sections. And there's three rooms. Well, there's four rooms. The bathroom, where you sleep. And then a room controlling the air and stuff, whatever. <laughs> and you get to choose what room you're in, so you don't... I can't really say the number. It's not like I'm good at counting. <laughs> but there, you sleep on bunk beds? Yeah. yeah. And you got to choose your bunk bed. Yeah. And I also heard that uh, you might have done high ropes course, Kinsley. Yeah. Rock walls, high ropes, of course, mud pits. I heard about the mud pit. So camp is just a really, really awesome place. And some of you haven't gotten to go to camp yet, but you will. And I know that you'll have a great time. I, Brad's been at camp, and he has a... We, we did do the high ropes course, Brad, and I were brave. We did it. Um, Victoria, some of you know Victoria. She couldn't be here today because she woke up not feeling well. Um, but she really wanted everybody in church to know how much camp has meant to her. And she's been going to camp for, I think, seven or eight years. And this was might have been her last summer to get to go. So it's been a really important part of her life. Today, when we have our giving time, we're going to think about giving gifts to our camp scholarship fund. We have a fund at church where if you guys want to go to camp, People in this church think it's important enough that they want to give money to help you be able to go to camp. So when we give today, we're going to think about giving money to that camp fund so that any of you that want to go as you get older have that chance to go and experience all the things that these youth got to experience this summer. Let's pray together and then I'll let you go to Sunday school. Dear God, thank you so much for the students who shared today, who were brave and shared about their experience at camp, we are so thankful that you had, uh, that you touched their life in that way that only church camp can do. And I'm so thankful for Camp Horizon, for the leaders, the counselors, all the people who put their time and energy into planting seeds into these young people and helping them to love you and want to spend more time with other people who love you, God. I ask that you uh, help us to have a great week and thank you for bringing us together this morning. Amen. All right, thank you, you guys. You can head to Sunday school. Last week, we began our agricultural journey through the teachings of Jesus by putting our hands to the plow, preparing the land, and keeping our eyes focused on Christ. Today, we begin the work of planting seeds in faith. Hear now the parable of the sower from the Gospel of Matthew. That day, Jesus went out of the house and sat down beside the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he climbed into a boat and sat down. The whole crowd was standing on the shore. 
He said many things to them in parables. A farmer went out to scatter seed. As he was scattering seed, some fell on the path and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on rocky grounds where the soil was shallow. They sprouted immediately because the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it scorched the plants and they dried up because they had no roots. Other seed fell among the thorny plants. The thorny plants grew and choked them. Other seed fell on the good soil and bore fruit. And in one case, a hundred to one. In another, yield of 60 to one. And in another case, a yield of 30 to one. Everyone who has ears should pay attention. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right, so last week we kicked off our new Farm to Table worship series where we are taking a look at some of the agricultural metaphors that we find in the stories and parables of Jesus. And we're sort of trying to follow a natural farming rhythm. So last week we started with plowing. Then this week we're planting, uh, next week we'll be harvesting, and then finally we'll wrap up the series by breaking bread at the communion table. And quite fittingly, last week we got an introduction to this series from an actual farmer, uh, from someone who is an expert in this area and who knows all the ins and outs and history of farm equipment. However, for this week and for the rest of the series, uh, you get to hear all about farming from a city girl who can't even keep a bell pepper plant alive. That is a true story. Um, so just, just throwing it out there as a warning that if you came back this week eager to hear more about the nuances and complexities of agribusiness through the ages, um, it's possible that you might wind up a little disappointed. However, I wanted to start by assuring you that my farming credentials aren't completely zero. Um, my parents did keep a small garden in the backyard when I was a kid. My folks couldn't find any good pictures of the garden in full bloom, but I think this is actually helpful because this would have been right at the planting stage. My mom said she thinks those are strawberries um, on, in that little row back there. Um, and I remember we grew things like tomatoes and sometimes we grew our own pumpkins for jack-o'-lanterns and we did a lot of watermelons and we even grew sunflowers, a very Kansas thing to grow in Colorado. I hope they looked better than that at some point. Maybe Colorado is not the right place for sunflower growing. But um, I just remember uh, really enjoying going outside when I was a kid and watering the plants and watching their progress. And I found that there was something almost magical about watching the growth process, about watching something go from seed to sprout to actual piece of produce that you could find in the supermarket. Because again, a suburban girl, for me, you know, going outside and finding strawberries on the ground, I mean, I might as well have been like finding shoes on a bush or something like that. It was, that was mind blowing. Like, wow, this thing comes in stores and it actually grows out here in my yard. Amazing. City girl. <laughs> Um, I, did, uh, I did, though, have a little experience with real farms before moving to Kansas. My great-grandparents on my mom's side were wheat farmers in northeastern Colorado. That's my great-grandpa Kenneth there in that picture. And we often went up to the farm on the weekends when my brother and I were little. Before it was hit by a tornado in the year 2000, um, they had a picturesque little farmhouse and a big red barn that was perfect for climbing and exploring in and hopefully not getting tetanus in. I, don't rem I, I remember a lot about playing in the barn. I don't remember going out into the fields all that much. Um, however, I am happy to report that as of this most recent summer, my family and I have finally gotten some real hands-on experience with, uh, with harvest time. 
Back in June, we took our kids out to the Baldwin's farm, and they had a lot of fun climbing on the equipment and hand threshing the wheat and stuff like that. Um, and then I also went out to the Warners one afternoon, and I got to ride in a combine for the very first time. And I was totally overdressed. Um, I wasn't planning on going to the farm that day, so I was in like dress shoes and a skirt. And I get there, and I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to climb into a combine. Interesting. Um, and oh, when I got home, it looked like I had a dirt tan, like my legs were gross. Um, so uh, next time, note taken, I will dress more appropriately. Um, but so all of that is to say that even though I personally do not have much in the way of a green thumb, um, I do know and love and admire many people who do. And honestly, I've always been kind of in awe of those who devote their lives to growing things from the earth because not only is it a very necessary vocation, but it's also one that has always struck me as being inherently spiritual. There's a lot of faith and trust that go into the art of farming, and it's a really profound way of participating in God's ongoing acts of creation. And that's part of why I'm so excited for this worship series. The, the Bible is just chock full of agricultural stories and parables, and there is a richness to the theology of planting and harvesting that I'm looking forward to exploring. Now, as Jay mentioned last week, all of this farming imagery also ties in to the strategic outcomes that our church council adopted last year to guide our congregation's mission for 2022 to 2024. Our overall vision for the coming years is that we are a congregation that is growing deep, growing wide, and growing joy. And what this means is that as a congregation, our goal is to grow deeper in our relationship with God and with one another, to grow wider in our service to and with the community around us, and to grow more joyful when we gather for worship and fellowship and ministry. And part of our plan for achieving these outcomes is a three-year discernment process um, that's designed to kind of help us figure out how God is calling our congregation to use our gifts and live out our mission during this chapter of our story. And so every year um, between 2022 and 2024 is going to have a different focus for our church leadership and our church staff. So in 2022, the focus has been preparing the land we're assessing our congregation's gifts and passions and looking at how we operate and figuring out how we can best equip ourselves uh, for fruitful ministry going forward. So the strategic parties that Deacon Jeannie and I have been holding um, have been a big piece of this. And um, one part that's come out of this process has been uh, looking at this move from a four-committee structure to a more nimble and streamlined single-board leadership model that we've been talking about um, over the last few months. So that's been 2022. Next year, in 2023, we are going to be planting the seeds doing some new and exciting missional things that will have bubbled out of our work from this preparation year. And then in 2024, we trust that we will be blooming and growing in some new ways as we build on whatever grows from those seeds that we'll be planting in faith. So last week, the sermon was all about preparing the land, and Jay Warner gave us an in-depth look at the history and theology of the plow, and today, we are looking at the next step. We are going to be planting seeds. So you might notice that up here on the altar, we had a giant plow last week. Um, it has been replaced with a planter, this lovely antique planter. Um, if you had asked me a week or two ago, I would have had no idea how it worked, but I got a tutorial uh, this last week, so I can act like I know what I'm doing when I tell you about it. So, if I recall correctly, and if I have the right idea in mind, there is a little hoe down at the bottom that scoops a slot in the earth, and then whatever you're planting, you put the seeds into that canister there, and then, um, so then as you're walking along, it's digging the hole, it's scattering the seeds, and then there are these little shovely things. Um, in the first service, I was just calling them, yeah, shovel scoopy things, which I was told later is definitely the right uh, technological agricultural term. Um, shovely scoopy things that fill, in the, that fill in the hole as you're walking along. So uh, farmers, is that close enough? 
Eh? I'm getting a few like very half-hearted nods, like sure, good enough, okay. Um, so basically, this device is doing three things at once. It is digging holes, it is planting seeds, and it's filling the holes back up uh, all at the same time, which I think is kind of ingenious when you really think about it. And I can only imagine how much time this thing would save compared to going out and manually uh, digging and planting seeds one at a time. It might not look super impressive to us today, 150 years after its creation, but this is the kind of technology that a farmer, like the one in today's parable, uh, couldn't have even imagined. And so, as we turn our attention to today's parable, we have Jesus talking to a large crowd of people, and he's telling a story about a farmer who goes out to scatter seeds into a field. Now, I always thought that this uh, manner of planting sounded kind of weird and haphazard, you know, to just be flinging seeds around all willy-nilly. Um, but I learned this last week that scattering seed like that is a valid agricultural technique. It's called broadcasting. And so once you've broadcast the seeds on the ground, you use a tool called a harrow to bury it and incorporate it into the ground. So that's the method that today's parable farmer is using. Seeds are being scattered. And Jesus tells us that each one of these seeds is going to have a different outcome. He tells us that some of the seeds are going to fall on the path and be eaten by birds. Others will fall into shallow soil, where they'll be able to grow for a little while, but then as soon as the heat gets turned up and as soon as the conditions get difficult, um, those plants are going to wither away because their roots weren't able to grow deep into the soil to get the nutrients they need. Some of the seeds, Jesus says, are going to fall into a patch of thorns where they won't even have a chance to sprout. But others are going to fall into the good soil and those seeds are going to produce abundantly. So abundantly, Jesus says, that some of these seeds are going to result in a harvest that is a hundred times greater than what was originally planted. Now, one of the interesting things about this particular parable is that parables are generally very vague, intentionally vague. They're meant to be things that you can really chew on and um, you know, it's possible to read a single parable in multiple different ways. There are a lot of different ways to interpret them, generally. Um, however, this one is unique because later on in the same chapter of Matthew, Jesus just sort of lays it all out there and breaks down the metaphor and tells us exactly what each piece of this story is meant to symbolize. Jesus explains that the seed that gets eaten by birds represents the people who hear the good news of God's kingdom, but don't understand it. So it's like a seed that gets snatched away and carried off before it has a chance to grow. He goes on to say that the seed that falls in the shallow soil represents people who hear the good news and start to get rooted in it, but um, they don't get deeply rooted in it. So the faith starts to grow, and then as soon as things get difficult, uh, it withers away quickly. The seed that falls on the thorns, he says, uh, illustrates what happens when people hear the good news with their ears, but uh, they reject it with their hearts because they're so focused on accumulating wealth and power and prestige. He tells us that those things prevent the good news from taking root at all. But then, he says, the, the seeds that fall in the good soil represent what's supposed to happen. Oh, my clicky thing is being weird. I might need help from the tech booth. There we go. Thank you. Might need new batteries. Um, so once the seeds fall into good soil, um, this shows what's supposed to happen. The seeds get planted in, oh, thank you, in good and rich and deep soil. Um, and then they're able to grow and blossom and produce a crop that is just beyond our wildest dreams. And, you know, I think, I, I was thinking earlier, um, in the first service, when, when, this, when the passage was being read from the scripture, I hadn't really made this connection before, but I find it very interesting. And, Tech, if you can hop ahead to the next slide. Um, something I found very interesting was that 
when Jesus is speaking to this crowd of people, it tells us in the Bible that he is speaking to a large crowd. And so he is preaching the good news of the kingdom to this big group of people. And he's telling a story about a farmer who is scattering a lot of seeds into the ground. And at the, story, the, the moral of the story is basically that not everyone who hears the good news is actually going to root themselves in it and grow in it and apply it. So it's it's just very intriguing to me uh, when I realize that Jesus is telling the story to a large crowd. I mean, he's basically saying, hey, I am, the, I am the farmer. I am scattering these seeds. And for some of you, it's going to take root. And for some of you, it's going to mean something. And for some of you, you're not going to be able to hear it. And some of you are going to reject it outright because there are other things going on in your lives that are more important. Um, I just find it very interesting that Jesus is essentially um, calling that out and naming that and saying that not every person is ready to hear the good news and not every type of soil um, is going to be the right place for it to grow. And so I think that that kind of ties into what my primary takeaway is from this parable and that is that planting really is an act of faith. Because when you're out there planting seeds, there is a lot that is just out of your hands. Thank you. <laughs> um, there's a lot that's out of your hands when you are doing the work of planting. And no matter how perfectly things go on your end, there's no way to be 100% sure of what the final outcome is going to be. Right? When we tell other people about God's love, when we try to live God's love in our relationships with other people, we don't know how they're going to respond. And we aren't in control of the outcome in their life. And I think that, I think that farming is such a great analogy for this because our contemporary farmers um, do their planting with a lot of intentionality. And I'm sure that if you were to ask any of the farmers you know, they would tell you that when they go out into the fields to plant, it is very unlikely that they're gonna let any of their seeds wind up in a cluster of thorns or on a pathway full of birds. Um, farmers do a lot to make sure that the seed winds up where it's supposed to be. And yet, even so, there are a million things outside of the individual's control uh, that can affect how the crop turns out. We can't control things like heat and humidity and rainfall, pests and microbes and natural disasters. It's just, there's just a lot of stuff that can crop up uh, between the planting and the harvesting. And I think that's the case with our spiritual planting as well. There's a lot in our relationships with other people, and there's a lot in our witness to the world um, that is outside of our control. But the good news is that God is in the process. No matter what happens, we can trust uh, that the success of our planting efforts is not fully on us. Because we're in a partnership with God. And the good news is that God will provide abundantly. Even if we can't see the final harvest, and even if we can't see the work that God is doing in the background, um, we can trust that the harvest is coming and that God is at work in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. Now, having said that, I do think that another takeaway that we get from this parable is that when you're planting seeds, it's going to be most effective if you are making an effort to aim for the good soil. So even though God is ultimately in charge of the outcome, um, we as people and we as the church have a role to play in the planting process. Because when you're being intentional about putting seeds in a place where they can be nurtured and where they can grow deep roots, it, that increases the chance of bringing in a good harvest. I mean, if you have a handful of seeds and you just dump them into a thorny briar patch, they're not going to have much of a chance. But if you intentionally uh, cultivate good and rich soil for your seeds, uh, then there's a much higher likelihood that they're going to grow. And so I think that our job as the church is primarily to be taking care of the soil and making sure that the seeds God plants can grow in a good and healthy and fruitful place. Which is kind of a relief to me um, when you think about it that way. I think there's something really helpful about remembering that we are not in charge of the seeds nearly so much as we are in charge of the soil. 
That's a big load of responsibility off of our plates, and it really puts things into perspective. Just a few weeks ago, I was talking to Deacon Jeannie about this whole three-year strategic plan we have, and I had a little moment of panic because I was like, oh my gosh, 2023 is just four months away, and we're supposed to be planting seeds next year, and I'm not quite sure what exactly we're going to be planting, right? It's almost the end of 2022. Surely we should know what next year's crop is going to look like. And Jeannie, in her great wisdom, <laughs> said to me, we know exactly what we're planting. We're going to be planting seeds. And it's okay that we don't know exactly what kind of seeds they are yet. Planting seeds for God's kingdom isn't like planting carrots. We don't know what type of seeds God is planting here at this church, and we don't know what the harvest is going to look like in the end. And that's okay. And that was such a helpful reminder to me, um, this reminder that planting seeds really is about faith and this reminder that we're not in charge of the harvest so much as we are in charge of the soil. And I think what that means for us as a church is that when we go out to plant seeds for ministry, we're going to have an idea and we're going to have a vision um, for what we're expecting to come next. And you know, Jeannie and I have been doing these strategic parties all year long, meeting with different groups in the church and learning about people's um, passions and strengths and things like that. We still have a, we still have a few more coming up um, between now and November. So if you haven't been to one yet, we, we do have more coming up. So uh, keep your eyes peeled and ears open for those. Um, and in those, in those parties, we've seen a lot of really great things bubbling up. We have seen a lot of excitement and passion around some specific ministry areas, and I think it's likely that those conversations are going to inform the planting work that we're doing next year. And yet, I also think that we need to be open to the possibility that the harvest we eventually bring in might be different from the crop that we originally expected. You know, it's possible that we'll start some kind of a program next year, and over time, God will grow it into something different or something that better fits the needs of the community. Maybe we'll think uh, next year that we're planting one thing, and a few years down the road, God will surprise us by bringing forth new life in an unexpected and wonderful way. Kind of like if you went out and planted carrot seeds and wound up with a crop of sunflowers. I guess what I'm saying is that we can't know right now what the final harvest is going to look like, either in the life of our church or in the lives of the people around us or in our own life. We don't know what's coming next. But what we can do um, as a congregation and as people is to make sure that our metaphorical soil is good and ready for whatever God decides to plant in it. So let me say that again. We can't predict the final harvest, but we can be intentional about being good soil for the harvest that God has in mind. And I think that as a congregation, we can do this in a number of ways. I think that as a church, we can become good soil by being discerning and becoming aware of our passions and our gifts which is a lot of what we've been doing this last year. And I think this is kind of like um, making sure that we're in the right field. It's about uh, making sure that we are placing ourselves exactly where God wants us, and it's positioning ourselves for ministry uh, that's coming up in the future. And once we know that we're in the right place, we have the ability to make the soil rich by pouring lots of resources into it. And so this means giving our time and our finances and our spiritual gifts to the life of the church so that whatever seed gets planted here uh, will be able to grow deep roots and be sustained for the long term. Also, I think that uh, we become good soil as a congregation by intentionally creating an environment where, oh, it got cut off, but creating an, an environment where new things can grow and thrive. And we do this by building relationships and by uh, participating in small groups, by, by, by building those really foundational one-on-one uh, -on -one relationships, um, by continuing to make this church a place of welcome and hospitality, to 
continue making this a place where newcomers are included in the mission and where people of all ages and from all different backgrounds can find a place to connect and serve. And as Sarah was saying this morning when she was talking about camp, I think that funding our camp scholarship program is a huge way of planting seeds. Um, so once again, just a quick plug to consider uh, making a contribution to that during our offering time later on in the service. Um, I remember when I was a kid growing up in Colorado, I went to summer camp, to Methodist summer camps, um, almost every year. And as I look back, I think seeds were being planted during that time that eventually led me to ministry. And I, I had no idea back then that that's the harvest that was coming up. Um, but looking back, I can, I can pinpoint different things and think, oh, that's why I was there. Or that's, that's what I was meant to be, you know, learning from that time. So um, the camping ministries thing is, is huge, and it's really a way of planting seeds in the lives of our young people. And we have no idea, um, you know, how those things will come to fruition, but we trust that God is at work. So I don't know is sort of the, uh, sort of the end point of this message. I don't know what the seeds that we're planting next year are going to produce. And I don't know um, what our ultimate harvest is going to be. I have some guesses and I have some ideas. And yet I'm also feeling very aware right now of the fact that God is the ultimate farmer. And I'm grateful that God is in charge of the sowing and the process. Um, because, wow, God does a much better job of it than any one of us can. Um, and I can't even begin to tell you how many times there have been over this last year where Jeannie and I will have a conversation with someone or we'll have an experience in worship or with confirmation students or with the kids where afterwards we look at each other and we say, oh my gosh, God is doing amazing things at this church and we just kind of hope that we can keep up. I really do think that amazing seeds are being planted in the life of this congregation. And I know that amazing seeds will continue to be planted here. And so my prayer for us today is just that we will be the very best soil that we can be um, in order for God to do that work in us. Thanks be to God and amen. As we enter into a time of prayer, I want to remind you of the prayer request cards that are in your pews. You can fill these out to request prayer, or you can request a care visit from a care minister or one of the pastors, and we'd be happy to um, contact you and provide that care. I also want to let you know of two prayer requests for our congregation. One, Pastor Emily mentioned earlier, if you can keep Susan Hawley and her family in your prayers. And also, I wanted to let you know that Dean Cotton passed away this morning, so if you could keep Esther and the Cotton family in your prayers as they navigate his loss and um, deal with that grief. So let's go to God in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we know that you are the sower, and we thank you for pouring life into us, for using us as the soil and the seed to spread your love and your good news out into the world. We pray that you would continue to work in our hearts and our lives and the groups in this church and the ways that we serve in our jobs and the ways that we engage in the community and the world, that you'd continue to work in us, preparing us to be good soil, preparing us to produce an abundant harvest. God, we bring you the needs of our community today. We ask for your healing presence with Susan 
and give strength and hope to her and her family. And we pray that your presence would be with Esther and the Cotton family. That they would feel you with them as they go forth through the next few days and weeks as they process the loss of a father, husband, grandfather. And God, we pray that you are be with the needs of our community, with those who don't know where their next meal is coming from, with those who are stuck in addiction, with those who are struggling with their physical or mental health, with those who feel there is no hope. Would you use us as we go forth from this place to be your presence and light in the world, to bring your hope to those who see no hope, to uplift and encourage those who don't know what their next step is. Lord, as we continue through our journey of growing deeper, growing wider, and growing more joyful, we pray that you would just work among us, that we would look forward to the abundant harvest and the amazing things that you will do through the people in this church and that you will do in our community. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we now come to that time in our service where we get the joy and the blessing of giving back to God a portion of what God has given to us. And a reminder that if you feel called to give toward our camping scholarships, um, we would love to receive those gifts and you can mark on your gift that it's for the camp scholarships. Will the ushers please come forward?
And you deserve all the glory. We pray that the gifts we give today might glorify you, that they might join in your fruitful work of planting seeds. And most of all, we ask that we might trust in your promise of harvest. May we be good soil, ready to produce, ready to bloom and grow and offer you the praise. It's in Jesus' name that we pray together. Amen. 
I invite you to stand if it's comfortable for you to do so. Let's join together in our closing song. sanctuary today, I would encourage you to rest in the knowledge that the work of planting is not all up to you. Our job is to be God's co-workers. Our job is to be good soil so that the harvest that God has in mind can come to fruition in God's time. Go in peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well wow.